Final Fantasy was once considered one of the biggest, if not the biggest gaming franchise. It's true that the series still sells millions with each new main installment, but most fans would agree that the mid-90s and early 2000s was a peak of the series' success and popularity. Games like Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy X are often cited as one of the reasons why the original PlayStation and PlayStation 2 sold well during their early years. And each mainline entry in the franchise was considered a system seller. But now, Final Fantasy seems to be a muddled name. While sales still remain high, the consensus seems to be that the quality has dipped. Not just with the infamous Final Fantasy XIII or the disastrous launch of Final Fantasy XIV, but even the well-received Final Fantasy XV was something of a divisive title, a game that split fans, as some feel that it was a great entry into the franchise while others felt it was a boring, uncoherent mess. And even many who did enjoy the game seemed to agree that despite it being a good title, it did not feel like a Final Fantasy game. And throughout all of this, I'm left with one question. What happened? This is the story of Final Fantasy, its creation, how it achieved its popularity and subsequent fall from grace for many fans. Before we can answer what happened to Final Fantasy, I believe we first have to discover what makes Final Fantasy, well, Final Fantasy. What makes the series tick and what was it that made it so special that connected with so many of us? And to do that, we need to go back to the beginning. Final Fantasy was originally launched for the Nintendo Famicom in 1987. The game was created by Square after a string of unsuccessful NES and Famicom games left the company with financial difficulties. It was here that Hironobu Sakaguchi jumped at the chance to create an RPG after nearly 5 years of begging his superiors to do so. Hironobu Sakaguchi had worked on visual novels slash adventure games before, such as the Death Trap games. But Square always believed an RPG would not be a commercially successful endeavor. Then, in 1986, Dragon Quest came out in Japan and took the market by storm, selling over 2 million units. Both Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy drew inspiration from the Ultima and Wizardry series. These games were developed in the West but found massive success in Japan and are arguably responsible for the creation of the JRPG and Western RPG genres as we know them. In essence, the formula we associate with the traditional JRPG is a mix of the open-world exploration of the Ultima games in which the player can roam the world visit cities, talk to NPCs, take quests and learn more about the story, with the combat being taken from wizardry, in which you control a party of adventurers with different classes who then proceed taking turns attacking each other. The fact Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy were developed in Japan helped them achieve success in their own markets as Japanese players would occasionally get stuck in some puzzles in wizardry, not due to translation issues, but due to cultural differences. These games also streamlined the world exploration, by essentially guiding players down a linear path, whereas Ultima was fully open-ended, causing many users to get lost. This, along with some graphical improvements over Ultima, Wizardry and even Dragon Quest, ensured Final Fantasy was a commercial and critical success in Japan, selling over 1 million units worldwide, saving Square and putting Hironobu Sakaguchi and his small development team on the map. Though the Final Fantasy formula would change and evolve over the years, the mechanical basics were all mostly laid out with the first game. You explore a large world in what is a mostly linear path. Battles are turn-based and initiated randomly when traversing through specific areas. Characters have unique classes or abilities, magic is mostly elemental and players need to figure out which elements are weak or strong against what. 
and they gain experience and level up as they win battles. These gameplay mechanics would more or less stay the same for 15 years as new sequels are developed. As the years followed, so did the series' success in its own home market. But things were a bit different over in the West. Over the years, Square would soon find that its games would be successful in Japan, but it could not break into the American or European markets. A sentiment shared by other Japanese RPG developers, including Enix, the company behind Dragon Quest. It was generally believed that the RPG genre was seen as alien for Western console owners, who up to this point were mostly used to action and real-time games. Whereas Final Fantasy's turn-based combat and dialogue-heavy plots were seen as an obstacle to overcome. But Square would not stop trying to succeed in the West with its flagship franchise. Attempts range from the massive simplification of the combat in Final Fantasy IV, a move which was well received at the time but is reviled in modern reviews, to creating a spin-off that distilled the formula to its barest essentials, creating a game that was as despised then as it is now. Okay, kid, show me what you got. Yeah, right. Next! Yes! Next! Ooh, scary. Next! 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 Final Fantasy 3. Do you have what it takes? Final Fantasy 3 from Squaresoft. Next! Regardless, Final Fantasy had achieved something of a cult status in the West, especially with the release of the 4th and 6th entries. You see, while the gameplay had remained mostly consistent between titles, it was the 4th and 6th entries that solidified the narrative themes, by which the series is known for. Up until that point, most Final Fantasy games had very little in the way of story. The second entry made an effort at telling a plot, but with limited success, most likely due to a combination of technical limitations with the 8-bit NES, lack of resources and team inexperience. But now, with the more powerful SNES and a few games under their belt, they could write better stories, better characters and better dialogues. Final Fantasy IV had plot progression, character progression, interesting set pieces and character dialogue. The story isn't perfect, but it had a story, with a beginning, a middle and a satisfying conclusion. From this point on, every mainline Final Fantasy game would feature the same narrative themes, but explored in different ways. Well, if you had to describe the story of each Final Fantasy game in one sentence, how would you do it? An epic story of love, hate, war and peace set in a massive new world. This one seems to fit. Every game starts in the middle of a war or at the brink of one, with all of its consequences. And if this line sounds familiar, it's because it can be found on the back of the box of Final Fantasy VIII. In a few short words, it perfectly describes the plot of every Final Fantasy game, even the early ones to some degree. The only thing I'd add in there is betrayal. An epic story of love, betrayal, hate, war and peace set in a massive new world. I can't think of a more apt description for this series. So I think we've discovered what makes Final Fantasy into Final Fantasy. A series of RPGs where you explore a massive new world, you meet new interesting people, some who fight alongside you while others seek to stop you. You meet friends, experience love, be it romantic or otherwise, and all that comes with it. You experience the horrors of war and the pain it brings, as well as peace and the joys it brings. You experience hate and most importantly, you experience an epic story that ties all of these elements together. So, what happened to Final Fantasy? Unfortunately, the answer to that also starts with the same game that helped the series find itself, Final Fantasy IV.
as previously mentioned, Final Fantasy IV was simplified for Western audiences, not just in gameplay, but story-wise as well. Many plot elements, especially death, were often downplayed with the English release, and the translation was often less than stellar. But eventually, Squaresoft's attempts to reach Western audiences were successful, becoming a worldwide phenomenon with the release of Final Fantasy VII, a game which, along with Metal Gear Solid, is often credited as one of the major reasons why the PS1 sold as well as it did. This is important, because while Squaresoft had finally achieved success in the West, Enix had not. Their games would be massively successful in Japan, but only moderately so in the US, and many would not even be launched in PAL regions at all due to poor sales forecasts. It should also be noted that despite Squaresoft being propelled to gaming stardom with their RPGs, the company was still smaller than Enix during this time. So, talks of a merger between both companies began. The idea was for a single company to control Japan's largest RPG franchises, while also using Square's marketing power to replicate Final Fantasy's Western success for Dragon Quest. Now, it's generally agreed upon that Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, a motion picture created by Square, which flopped in the box office, was the reason for this merger. But that's actually not true. Talks about the merger were making gaming magazine headlines while the movie was still in production, and hints were being given that these talks had been occurring well before that. In the meantime, a few prominent people had joined Squaresoft who would prove instrumental in turning Square Enix into what it is now. Tetsuya Nomura, who is the current head of the Final Fantasy franchise, joined Square in 1991 as a debugger for Final Fantasy IV. He would quickly grow in prominence becoming a graphic director and character designer for several Squaresoft games, until finally landing his first full directorial role with Kingdom Hearts. Hisashi Suzuki joined Square sometime in the early 2000s as its CEO, and was even briefly its president in 2002, before being downgraded to one of its directors. And then we have Yoichi Wada, who joined Squaresoft as an executive director and CFO in 2000. Wada, despite joining Square from the onset with a high decision position, did not see eye to eye with Hironobu Sakaguchi or Suzuki. Wada wanted Square to become a premier world gaming developer and publisher, much in the same style as Electronic Arts. And for him, this meant two things, a merger with Enix and making more Final Fantasy games. A lot more Final Fantasy games. And this is when the rift started to open within Squaresoft. Suzuki and Sakaguchi believed the merger would give too much control to Enix as they would get the majority share of the merger. Moreover, Hironobu Sakaguchi didn't want Final Fantasy to become oversaturated. It's also important to note that in 1997, Hironobu Sakaguchi and most of the core Final Fantasy team, Tetsuya Nomura excluded, had relocated to Honolulu, Hawaii. And this is where he resides to this day. This means that the creative minds behind the story and direction of the franchise were housed not in Japan, but in Hawaii. This physical distance is likely why Yoichi Wada was able to gain so much power and influence within Square's headquarters in Japan, but he still couldn't quite close the deal on the merger yet. That is, until Final Fantasy Spirits were in. This was going to be Square's big foray into the movie industry, to be more precise, the Western movie industry. A movie with massive hype and marketing push behind it, which was in development for years, with celebrity names like Alec Baldwin, James Woods, Donald Sutherland and Steve Buscemi. And Square truly hoped to make Final Fantasy a name anyone could recognize, not just gamers, but anyone. The movie was a massive undertaking, but also a massive risk, fully backed and supported by Sakaguchi and Suzuki. And then, on July 2, 2001, the movie launched, two dismal reviews and terrible box office sales. The movie had a budget of $137 million, but only made $30 million domestically in 2001. Square 
had a bomb on their hands. A big one. All plans of penetrating the casual and non-gamer markets in the West came to a screeching halt, and the higher-ups at Square were in a panic. And even though Final Fantasy X launched in that same year, the company still lost money in 2001. It's not that Square couldn't afford to pay the losses, but it was still a major blow to their finances. And more importantly, to all future plans envisioned for the Final Fantasy brand. This resulted in a massive loss of credibility for Hisashi Suzuki, but especially Hironobu Sakaguchi. And this was the chance Wada needed. Suzuki stepped down as Square CEO and Wada took his place, effectively running the company. Wada seized this opportunity to convince Squaresoft that his vision was the correct path for Square, a merger with Enix and produce Final Fantasy games at a much higher rate than ever before. And when the merger finally took place, Wada became its president, essentially running both companies. Wada took no time in enacting his vision either, as this 2003 business presentation at Square, now renamed Square Enix, shows. By producing cost-efficient development methodologies, producing more Final Fantasy titles, and the first ever Final Fantasy sequel, Final Fantasy X-2. Under his management, Square Enix acquired Taito in 2005 and Eidos Interactive in 2009, giving them access to franchises like Deus Ex, Tomb Raider, Hitman, and much more. Sakaguchi, on the other hand, was discredited and unhappy at Square, as he took on fewer roles on Squaresoft projects, and generally having fewer inputs on the projects where he did take roles before leaving the company with his Honolulu team in 2003 to form Mistwalker. However, it was clear that Sakaguchi wasn't happy at Square well before then, as he registered the Mistwalker domain and patent as early as May 2001, two months before Spirits Within premiered in theaters. And this, in my opinion, was when Final Fantasy died. Not when they left in 2003, but when its creator and the minds behind the franchise were outcast in 2001. And the impact of this decision can still be felt to this day. But that's not the end of our story. As Sakaguchi became increasingly distant from the company, Tetsuya Nomura grew in prominence. In part, thanks to his directorial roles in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, before eventually becoming the creative mind behind Final Fantasy as a whole. And so, between Wada's new strategy and Nomura's vision for the franchise, Final Fantasy and Square Enix became what we know today. Square Enix also did its best to downplay the fact that the creative minds behind Final Fantasy had left the company. In fact, for someone who was essentially responsible for creating one of the most beloved and long-lasting game franchises, the name Hironobu Sakaguchi seems to have been mostly forgotten. Not helped by Square Enix, indirectly implying Nomura is the true owner of the franchise. Thank you for joining us, Nomura-san. It is an absolute honor to have you here. Okay, stop. Can we just discuss this goddamn line? This line, this line right here, is the reason why I made this video. Yeah, I know, E3 was a while ago, but I needed to properly organize my thoughts and information before making this video. I just want to say that I have nothing against Nomura. He's an accomplished artist, developer and game director. But for the past decade, the games we've been getting are not Final Fantasy. And I'll get into that in a bit, but can I just say how in poor taste that line is when discussing a remake of the most popular game in the franchise while pretending the series creator does not exist? Okay, sorry, just needed to get that out of my chest. Let's continue. There are many problems with Final Fantasy games post Final Fantasy X, but they can all be attributed to the fact that in my opinion Tetsuya Nomura does not want to make Final Fantasy games. Let's take a look at the more prominent games in the franchise post 10. Final Fantasy X 2 had the gameplay mechanics for which the series was known for, but the story did not fit into what we know as Final Fantasy. Remember that line? An epic story of love, betrayal, hate, war and peace set in a massive new world. Well, this wasn't an epic story, it was Yuna's adventures as a sphere hunter. There's no war, 
Hate or Betrayal, nor is it set in a massive new world. It's the same world as Final Fantasy X. But more importantly, the tone was wrong. The tone was very light-hearted anime, complete with a J-pop intro, which reminds me the music. Every mainline Final Fantasy game, and even many Square games up to this point, share the same composer, Nobuo Uematsu, who has gone on to win several awards for his work in the series. But he didn't work in Final Fantasy X 2, or 11, 12, 13, any of the 13 spin-offs, or even Final Fantasy XV. So not only do modern Final Fantasy games lack the soul and the visuals that make them Final Fantasy, something I'll get into in a bit, but they don't even sound like Final Fantasy anymore. Instead, we get J-Pop, Leona Lewis and Florence and the Machine? What? I will say, the closest modern Final Fantasy has come to creating a soundtrack that feels like its classic games was Brave Exvius. A phone game of all things. Probably because it was composed by Noriatsu Agematsu, who has previously worked on the Wild Arms series. Final Fantasy XI I won't get too much into. Despite being a numbered entry, the online games are often seen as spin-offs and play differently due to the fact they are MMOs. So we can skip this one and 14 for the most part. Final Fantasy XII seems to have been a return to form in terms of narrative thematic but the gameplay was massively changed from past entries, featuring real-time combat and no random encounters. So this means we've had one game with perfect game mechanics but where the narrative themes don't fit, and one game where the narrative themes are correct, albeit not as well explored as past games if you ask me, but the gameplay was completely changed. This is why Final Fantasy X 2 and 12 were divisive games for the fanbase at the time of release. One fit the gameplay but not the soul, while the other fit the soul but not the gameplay. But the fans were still on board for the franchise. That is, until Final Fantasy XIII. <laughs> This was when Square Enix, Tetsuya Nomura, the creative teams and everyone involved in the higher decisions of the franchise showed they did not know how to make a Final Fantasy game. This game has been universally reviled for 10 years. Has it been 10 years already? Jesus! Anyway, like I said, this game has been universally reviled for 10 years and there's no point in beating a dead horse. But this was not Final Fantasy. It didn't play like one. It didn't feel like one. It didn't sound like one. And the narrative themes I mentioned before? Well, they fit, but only within the shallowest context. An epic story of love, betrayal, hate, war and peace set in a massive new world. The story is epic, but barely comprehensible. We see war and betrayal, but we never see peace. We're always running from one enemy filled corridor to the next, with no chance to stop and appreciate how day to day life is supposed to be in this world. We know there's love between Sarah and Snow, but we never get to actually see it. We only see it through flashbacks, which robs a player of the emotion of experiencing it. If it's already happened, and if we already know the conclusion, then there's really no emotional weight to it. The closest we get to see love in this game is with Saj and the love for his son. His scenes felt emotional and genuine, whereas Snow and Sarah felt like characters going through the motions. Which is why I feel Final Fantasy XIII does not work on any level. I will be honest, I haven't played 13 2 or Lightning Returns yet. I have heard they are actually good games and that the gameplay mechanics are actually much closer to what the series used to be. Maybe one day I'll review them, but for now there are still more games I want to discuss. The first is Final Fantasy Type-0 HD. Despite not being a number title, it was a major Final Fantasy release this generation and the first game of the series on the PS4. I will also say, it's one of my favorite games in the series, but also the game that made me realize Final Fantasy is dead. 
Here we have a game with an incomprehensible main plot, but which mostly hits the themes we've just discussed. The story is suitably epic and does an outstanding job at portraying war and its consequences, as well as hate, betrayal and peace. It even does a great job at portraying love, just not romantic one, but rather the love and sorrow felt for those lost during a war and the lengths people will go to protect them or honor their memories. And it's also set in a new world which can be explored and it even has random combat. And yet, it doesn't feel like a Final Fantasy title. It's a game which I truly love, yet so much about it feels wrong as part of this franchise. The combat is in real time, magic, which was once a prominent strategic element of the series, is rarely, if ever, needed. Summoning is an afterthought at best and useless at worst. Most main characters are anime stereotypes whose motivations are never properly explored. The banter between them is fun and believable, but functions differently from any game in the series, as none of them are in a personal journey. They don't grow as characters and they don't have character arcs. And yet, the story, or rather the side stories, are still some of the best and most emotional war stories I've seen in any Final Fantasy game. And this is when it finally hit me. This is a Final Fantasy game in name only, so was 13 for that matter. And the same goes for 15. Final Fantasy 15 has the same combat problems I've just listed for Type 0. It's in real time, magic is useless, summons are pointless, and I'd argue the combat here, though similar to Type 0, was actually a downgrade from that game. In Type 0, you had 15 different characters, each with their own completely unique playstyle. In Final Fantasy XV, you could only play as Noctis. True, this was changed later through a patch, but the fact the patch was needed months later to even let you play as other characters in your own party is pretty telling. Narrative-wise, it seems to once again fit with the series' themes. But, just like with 13, it only does so in the most shallow ways. Your team remains mostly the same throughout the game, and they all already start as friends who trust each other from the moment you pick up the controller. This, once again, robs a player of experiencing those character growth moments. Instead, if you want to see how their relationships were formed, you're expected to watch a 5-episode anime and a movie. Because who doesn't like doing homework for a video game, instead of experiencing these things in the game itself? Instead, you build confidence with your teammates by taking selfies together. Let me take a selfie. Because I guess that's what counts for emotional weight in games these days. And honestly, I'd argue the games don't even look like Final Fantasy. I know Tetsuya Nomura is the main character designer in these games, and you can usually tell when a character is designed by him. Lulu's belt dress, Sion from The Bouncer, Sora from Kingdom Hearts… Hell, look at his interpretation of Batman and tell me that's not the most Final Fantasy boss design you've seen all day. But the problem is that all of these games feel like they belong in the same world, whereas previous Final Fantasy games kind of didn't. Sure, the first games were clearly fantasy, and Final Fantasy IX was a throwback to those days. But with VI onward, every game felt like it took place in its own universe, or at least at a different time within the same world. VI was a World War I steampunk-like world. 7 was a cyberpunk dystopic future. 8 was kind of like 7, albeit less sci-fi and more modern. 9 was pure fantasy. 10 was a post-apocalyptic tribal-like world. 12, I'm not sure how to describe it, but it was clearly doing its own thing as well. But 13, 15 and Type 0 all look like they could take place in the same world at roughly the same time period. There's no visual variety or world variety between them. I don't think these are bad games, but I do think they should not be called Final Fantasy. Perhaps something like Fable Nova Crystallis, because it clearly seems like Nomura is less interested in making Final Fantasy games and more interested in making Kingdom Hearts with a fresh coat of paint. 
But then, is Tetsuya Nomura to blame? He became the figurehead of this franchise, but I don't think it's his fault. He's just following his creative vision and is trying to make it fit into a pre-existing series. I think the fault lies with Water and Square Enix itself, as well as its focus on pumping out game after game in this franchise. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this were the reason why it took Tetsuya Nomura nearly 15 years to finally launch Kingdom Hearts 3. And the rate at which Square Enix releases new Final Fantasy titles has become alarming to say the least. Between 1987 and 2000, the year in which Wada joined Squaresoft and eventually became its CEO, Squaresoft released 14 games, not counting direct ports like the MSX port of Final Fantasy 1. Square released Final Fantasy 1 through 9, Tactics, Chocobo Dungeon 1 and 2, Chocobo Racing, and Mystic Quest for the Super Nintendo. I'm not counting Final Fantasy Adventure or Legends because those are part of the Saga and Mana series and were only branded as Final Fantasy for the West. But between 2001 and 2019, Square Enix has released, again, not counting ports or direct emulation re-releases, Final Fantasy Origins, which is a remake of 1 and 2, a remake of Final Fantasy 3 for the DS, a remake of Final Fantasy 4 for the DS, Final Fantasy 10, Final Fantasy 11, Final Fantasy 11 Rise of the Zealart, Final Fantasy 11 Shades of Promethea, Final Fantasy 11 Treasures of Ad Urgan, Final Fantasy 11 Wings of the Goddess, Final Fantasy 11 Secrets of Adeline, Final Fantasy 12, Final Fantasy 13, Final Fantasy 14, Final Fantasy 15, Final Fantasy X2, Final Fantasy VII Snowboarding, Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings, Final Fantasy IV The After Years, Final Fantasy VII Jeep Bike, Final Fantasy Grandmasters, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, Final Fantasy Tactics A2 Grimoire of the Rift, Final Fantasy Tactics S, Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII Dirge of Cerberus, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy Type-0, Final Fantasy XIII 2, Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII, Final Fantasy Agito, Final Fantasy Awakening, Justice Monsters 5, A King's Tale Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy XV A New Empire, King's Knight Wrath of the Dragon, Monster of the Deep Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy XV... Yeah, I'm just gonna skip to the end. 83! 83 Final Fantasy games. I repeat, in 18 years, we've gotten 83 Final Fantasy games. That's literally one new game every two and a half months. It's no wonder so many fans now feel disconnected or burnt out of this series. And can you believe I'm still going? Final Fantasy All the Bravest, Pictologic and Final Fantasy, Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call, Final Fantasy Worldwide Worlds, Final Fantasy Record Keeper, Final Fantasy Art Mix Dive, Heaven Strike Rivals, Final Fantasy Explorers, Final Fantasy Dimensions 2, Final Fantasy Brave Exvius, Final Fantasy Mobius, and World of Final Fantasy. <sighs> and that's not even mentioning all the brand deals. BMW in Final Fantasy XV, Lightning selling Louis Vuitton handbags, Ariana Grande as a playable character in Brave Exvius, Jamie Oliver recipes in Final Fantasy XV, and the list keeps going. The irony of it all is that by 2012, Square Enix was worth less than Squaresoft alone was before the merger. And Hisashi Suzuki has gone on record to call the merger a total failure, citing there is no vision for the future. At this point, what else is there to say? It's so easy to draw a line in the series. A line of when the creator and his team had an input on Final Fantasy and when he stopped having an input. For me, the series ended with 10. But what happened with Hironobu Sakaguchi and his original team? As previously stated, they formed Mistwalker, a company whose initial outings were a little bumpy. Their first game was Blue Dragon, ironically, a Dragon Quest ripoff, which was… it was okay, I guess. Their second attempt was Lost Odyssey, a game which I've personally always considered to be the true successor to Final Fantasy X, a game which fits all of the gameplay and narrative themes the Final Fantasy series was known for. 
the combat is similar, the mechanics are similar, the story hits all the right notes, even the menus are similar to Final Fantasy. Unfortunately, while Mist Walker handled the creativity, the development side was outsourced to other companies. As a result, review copies suffered from long load times and other issues which were corrected on release but not in time to correct scores. Moreover, it was released during a time when the gaming media seemed to be suffering from turn-based combat burnout. A burnout which thankfully seems to have ended, considering how well received games like Persona 5, Octopath Traveler and Bravely Default were received. But sadly, the damage was done. Lost Odyssey was to become the Xbox's Final Fantasy, but this never materialized, likely due to poor sales, which resulted in another Xbox 360 exclusive RPG, Cryon, to be cancelled. Their last major release was The Last Story, an exclusive RPG for the Wii which received critical praise but did not achieve high sales. In the end, Mistwalker is now relegated to developing phone games, a sad ending for the team behind a series as big and popular as Final Fantasy. As we near closer to the end of the video, I'd like to leave you with some words by Nobuo Uematsu the series composer until Final Fantasy X. No matter what happens in the future with the company of Square Enix, and with the individual Sakaguchi, one thing that's not going to change is that he's the father of Final Fantasy. He made the series. It's really hard to say this, but I really don't think Final Fantasy should have been made after Sakaguchi's son left the company. I think at the same time that they started to change the direction of the company, we weren't sure who was in charge of what. We did treat each and every Final Fantasy as a birth of something, as a great product that we believed in. All we really wanted to do was be able to express a very simple belief of friendship or family love, or just love in general. And with this, we've reached the end of our video. A promising development team and series took the world by storm through thoughtful storytelling and gameplay mechanics that required players to think before acting. Unfortunately, its creator lost all control of his work and his work and brand name are now being used to mass-produce games, sequels and spin-offs which only model the Final Fantasy series. It's clear Square Enix has no clear direction with the series other than making more games. But I feel the series can still be salvaged, perhaps by going back to basics, perhaps if they look into what drew people into the original games. Perhaps if Square Enix contacts Mistwalker and bring back Snobo Uematsu or a composer who can carry in his name. Perhaps Final Fantasy can return to being what it once was. Thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to support my channel, please subscribe or check out my Patreon.